All right, should women be in ministry, specifically in the position of a pastor? Well, I'm going to give you an answer that I've never heard any pastor give, no YouTube teacher or anybody give. And we're going to start with the definition of one word, or actually two words, that's going to frame this entire conversation about pastors and about church and whether women are actually allowed to speak in church. So the definition I want to give you is the Greek definition to the word church, right? Because if we're going to talk about this idea, I think that it's important that we know what church is and what the Bible means when it says church, as well as the word pastor and what the Bible means when it says the word pastor. Because if we don't know these two things, then we don't know if a woman can be the pastor of a church, considering two of the words of that sentence right there are in context of words that you probably define wrong already. At least most people do. So let's start with the word woman. I think that one's really easy. Woman means woman. When you look at the Greek of the word woman, it means woman. So we're good there. So we're good there. Second word is the word church. The Greek word church is ekklesia in the Greek. And this Greek word means the ones who are sent forth, the ones who are called out, the ones who are gathering together. These are tend to be the, the definitions of the word church. Now, I should step back for a second, and, and this is important context. The word church is not a biblical word. That is something that most Christians do not know. The word church was used all of the time back then in their, their world and Roman culture. And you would have churches everywhere doing all sorts of things. You would have churches that would be basketball churches. You would have Bible reading churches. You would have play churches. These, the word church here simply means a group of people with kind of a common goal or a common like-mindedness that they have together. In this sense, these are all people who are interested in the same thing, which would be Jesus, right? So that's what the word church means. The reason this is important is if we start this convent that you go to today, then you have a completely warped view of what the Bible talks about when the Bible says church. When Paul mentions the word church in his epistles, he is not referencing a Sunday morning two hour event where we gather and we talk about Jesus for a little bit. We have some worship music, fog lights and, 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 and lights, and then we go home and maybe you do communion every week or something like that. That is not what Paul had in mind when he was saying the word church. Now. That doesn't mean that you going to your church is wrong. I'm not saying your church is sinful, and I'm not saying that your church should even stop doing some of the, or even a lot of the things that they're doing. What I am saying is that that isn't what the Bible defines as church. So the reason that that's important is we need to know what the actual authors meant by what they said when they said a word like church. So for example, when we see the word church used by Paul, he actually even specifies in the book of Romans, and I believe Thessalonians as well. Don't quote me on the Thessalonians one, but that he was talking about the church that meets in their home. Now, I'm not a proponent for house church. I don't think that house church is the solution to all of our church issues. I think that Christians representing Christ well does. Actually, here. I think that my shirt is the answer to that question or the issue that we have today is God is building men, not buildings. Again, doesn't mean we're not allowed to build buildings. Jesus meant in plenty of them, right? What it means is that we are supposed to be building people up to do the work of the ministry. That's the point. So I'm not a proponent of house church. I don't think house church solves anything. It's just a smaller version of an institutionalized larger church, right? But the point is, if we think of it in context of a house church, I think this makes it a lot easier for us to come to an understanding. Here's what I mean. If I say that there is a group of people who are meeting in your house, most people would define kind of a house church thing as like a small group that's done just on a Sunday morning. And I think that's a pretty fair representation of at least the general idea. But I want us to now read from Acts 2 to get an answer on church and to get an answer on what they saw church looking like. Acts 2 and Acts 4 gives us a great indication of what we should see today's church looking like. Acts 2 verse 37, it says, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and all those who are far off as many as the Lord has called to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day were added 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves. Here's the part I want you to get. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, to the breaking bread, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and signs and wonders were taking place through the apostles and all those who believed were gathered, had all things in common and began selling their possessions and laying the proceeds as the apostles at the apostles' feet as any might have a need. Day by day, continuing in one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals 
together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to their numbers day by day, those who were being saved. So there's four really big key points that I think that the scriptures talk about here that you should consider in regards to what church should look like. That these are people who were teaching, they were fellowshipping, they're breaking bread, eating meals together. This wasn't like they were just like eating like crackers, like stale crackers and like a shot glass of juice. And like, that's what they were calling it. Uh, and then they were praying together. These are like the four key points that we see. And then we can go to like, you know, I think it's first Corinthians 12, 24, where it says, when you come to brother, come together, brethren. Some of you have a Psalm, a hymn, a tongue, an interpretation. All these things are used for the edification or the building up of the body, right? That's another place where we see scripture mentioned. Hebrews 10, 25 is one of the most common. Do not neglect the gathering of the saints as have some, but as the day draws near, stir up one another in love and in good works. These are the things that we see in scripture. And then I think that it's a bit of a, a misinterpretation of scripture or out of context at least, but you'll see scripture say uh, in Matthew 18, you know, where two or more gathered in my name for I am in their midst. Again, very true, but I don't think that's necessary. That's in reference to an Old Testament passage in regards to bring judgment upon somebody. Um, that's not necessarily in reference to fellowship. Can it be used for that? Yeah, I suppose it can, but that's not exactly what it means. So the point is, is when you see the Bible's definition of church, which should kind of rewire or give you a little bit of a paradigm shift here, then I hope that that gets your wheels spinning a little bit in regards to what maybe a woman in ministry might be able to or should look like. Think about it. In there, and nowhere in the early church at all, do we see anything about a children's ministry, about a youth ministry, about a daycare for the kids? Now, again, I'm not saying that those things are wrong or bad to have. But when we see the early church authors make statements like in 1 Timothy, where Paul seems like he might be indicating that women need to sit down, shut up, cook, clean, make baby, and never teach ever in a church, we need to consider what he meant by in a church. And then here, here's one of, the, one of the challenges that I have. I'm about to define the word pastor, but one of the challenges I also have with this is oftentimes when I hear somebody say, women are not called to be in ministry, right? Generally, the question isn't whether women can be pastors or not. I more regularly, at least personally in my ministry online and in person, I more regularly hear, can a woman be in ministry at all, let alone as the pastor of a church? So I'm gonna discuss both of those things, but the, the one about in ministry and all, at all, I think is a really silly one because I have never seen a church in my life, regardless of their view on this topic, that says that a woman's not allowed to work in the daycare or the nursery, or that a woman's not allowed to work in the children's ministry. I've never seen that. I've never seen any of these churches, or at least the majority of these churches, would allow a woman to be a greeter at the door, or one of those people maybe who is doing the vacuuming through the week. So to say that a woman's not allowed to be in ministry, I think is really, really silly. Because again, when we define the word ministry, it's just doing something for the Lord, right? I mean, look at how Acts 5 defines ministry, right? Peter says, I need to find seven men full of the Holy Ghost and of good rapport who will wait tables. For widows. That was their ministry. Their ministry was waiting table for widows. So would you say that a woman can't do that either? Because again, I think we would all agree, well, yeah, of course a woman could do that. And right now I'm trying to do more of an intellectual explanation versus just a scriptural explanation with my point there. Obviously, if I can't read that in scripture, then it doesn't matter anyways. But now we're going to talk about that in scripture. And obviously, we see plenty of women doing ministry, right? Uh, we see Ruth doing ministry. We see Esther doing ministry. You could argue that's Old Covenant. We see uh, Ananias and, and, and Sapphira. They were at least attempting to do ministry, right? Um, we see plenty of people, even females in the New Testament, who are doing ministry. And we don't have any reason to believe that that was a solely you know, male kind of thing. So I think that that one's pretty easily able to be put to bed. But as a pastor... This is generally where the argument, the debate, the heat, the fire comes, right? Is whether they can be a pastor. And not only a pastor, but the lead pastor, a senior pastor, or teaching pastor of a church. So first off, again, I'm just, I'm just not, I don't wanna say playing devil's advocate. I feel like that's such a terrible phrase, but I just wanna get your, your wheels turning here. Can a woman be a worship pastor? Okay, so they can be a worship pastor, probably most people would agree, I think, but they can't be a pastor pastor. Well, what's the difference really? Because again, we got, we got to take the nuance and say, what is the difference that is determining whether they can be a senior pastor, worship pastor, youth pastor, or, you know, and, and again, there's a lot of debate with that. Can a woman be a youth pastor? Because at youth stage, now we've got older, more mature people who can understand these things more, more efficiently, but to what extent? And again, a children's pastor, I think that most people would say, yeah, a woman can be a children's pastor. I, again, I've at least personally not heard a lot of people give a lot of pushback to that. 
So what's the difference? Are children less valuable to Jesus than the older people are? And again, consider in early church times, they did not have this dividing of different age groups like we do today. I see the benefit in it. I see the reasons that people do it, but I think that a lot of times it'd actually be more beneficial to just keep them all together. That's a video for a different time. I'm not going to go into a deep dive on that, but the point here is a woman could be a children's pastor, but not a youth pastor or somewhere between children's and senior pastor. There's some sort of disconnect. Again, my first challenge would be that's not consistent intellectually to say that they can be a worship or a children's pastor, but they cannot be a senior pastor or to say that they can be a worship pastor, but they cannot be a senior pastor. Again, the majority of churches that I hear that say that women cannot be in ministry or lead pastors in ministry will let them be lead worship leaders in ministry. And even if they don't define themselves as the title of being the worship leader or worship pastor, they're still doing the same thing. Because most people would say, well, in 1 Timothy, the argument is that these women are not allowed to teach. What do you think that songs are doing? Songs are unquestionably teaching you doctrine. I, I, I don't think I've ever met a Christian who would disagree with that either. These songs are unquestionably teaching you doctrine, and that doctrine is being taught or spoken by the person who is, in this case, the female singer. So even if they're just like, you know, singer number three or four down the line, still, why would you let a female on your worship team if that's the case? Because that's also not intellectually consistent because she's definitely teaching. And if you're saying, well, no, 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 she, it's not like she wrote it. She's just repeating what somebody else wrote. Okay, what if somebody read a female, read Charles Spurgeon's sermon word for word? Is that okay? I think that most people would say, no, that's not okay. Because that's, again, a woman teaching and it's going against what we're seeing talked about in, again, a plethora of places. But the main one I think that people always talk about is Timothy, right? So now I want to define the word pastor. And then we're going to dive into this scripture that is the, the big, you know, uh, elephant in the room uh, that's the challenge here about whether a woman can speak in context of what Paul is saying in some of his letters. The word pastor, if you define it into the Greek, again, we do Greek because the original language is written in Greek uh, for the New Testament, Greek and Aramaic and, and Hebrew for the Old Testament and some Aramaic in the Old Testament as well. Greek is what it was written in the New Testament and, and we need to consider the Greek words that were being said. Because remember, if I say the word, I love you and I love Cheetos too, you have a different context for both of those words. Back then in that day, love is just the easiest one to do this with. But there were three or arguably four words in Greek that were used in the New Testament for love. And those four, three or four Greek words that were used in the New Testament for love had different meanings. And those meanings are ex uh, ridiculously different than our meanings of those things today. So if I tell you that I love Cheetos, or let me rephrase that. If I say I agape Cheetos, um, because you know agape is one of the Greek words for love, then somebody in there, you know, language back then would have really scratched your head and gone, that doesn't make any sense. What do you mean you agape Cheetos? That doesn't make any sense at all. If I said I phileo Cheetos, that also wouldn't make any sense to them, right? So my point is, is your context of a, a word in English and not understanding the Greek definition of it will do a lot of twisting your understanding of it, as well as obviously how it's played out, right? So if, if, if I were to show you an example of what it looks like to be in love with somebody, You'd say, even though I don't have a definition, if you said this is love and then you were to portray an act of love, like laying your life down for a brother, you'd have a really good definition of the word love, which scripture does a lot, right? Again, this love word is a great example of this. There are people who use the word love and define it themselves in scripture, but it's not necessarily even the Greek definition of the word love. So you got to consider that in this context as well. Jesus says, no greater love has a man than this, that he would lay down his life for his brother. That's not the Greek definition of any love word. Now, you can put that in context of the word agape love, but that's not what it says. That's not what the definition of agape says. How about 1 Corinthians 13, right? Paul's love um, you know, list. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not boast. Love does not envy. Love does not keep record of wrong. It's not self-seeking. All of these things that love is are great things that you can use as the definition of love used in 1 Corinthians 13, but that is not the Greek definition of the word love either. So getting contextual understanding as well as getting the Greek definition of this word is extremely beneficial. The word pastor simply is a shepherd. Think about a shepherd looking over their sheep, somebody like David in the Old Testament. They're looking over their sheep. They're taking care of the flock. They're tending to the needs of the flock. With that singular and exclusive definition of the word pastor, there's not other ones, by the way. You can look it up in Greek. You can look at a Strong's Concordance and look it up. That's the only one you'll see. With this understanding, 
does teaching go anywhere in protecting the flock? And especially if we look at Jesus, because I think he's a really important figure to look at with this. His talks and conversations, like in John uh, chapter 10, I believe it is, where, or, or maybe it's 14, where he's talking about taking care of the sheep and the good shepherd uh, takes care of his sheep and his sheep will hear and obey his voice and the, and the strangers he will not follow. When you see this whole conversation here about how they're not going to get attacked by the wolf, any of these things, it's really important to see what Jesus sees a shepherd doing. He's taking care of, he's fending for, he's making sure that the, the spiritual wellness of the church is good. Now, is teaching an aspect of that? Well, yes, you can't do any ministry whatsoever without teaching in some capacity. Even if it's not with words, everything that you do is teaching to some capacity, either good or bad. Now, let's assume the fivefold ministry for a second, because pastor, remember, is one of five. So this word pastor is used two times in the entire New Testament. One time is in Ephesians uh, 4.11, and the other time, I don't remember exactly where it is. I'm going to take a guess and say Titus, but don't quote me on that. Ephesians 4.11 says God gave some as apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors for them to, to equip the saints with the work of the ministry, for the work of the ministry, excuse me. These are the five vocations that are given to the body of Christ, exclusively five. Now, obviously we can argue about whether apostles and prophets exist today. The conversation is not about that. And I'm not even going to talk about that in this video because I don't want my view of that on either direction to determine whether you validate or just reject everything I say from here on out. Unfortunately, Christians do that a lot with throwing the baby out with bathwater. I don't want you to do that. So I'm not even gonna talk about this. Let's just talk about evangelist, teacher, and pastor. No one, I have never heard a single Christian again, argue whether an evangelist, a teacher, or a pastor exists today. I think we're all in agreement. Evangelism needs to happen. Pastoral work needs to happen and teaching needs to happen. So if we look at the definition today in a church of the word pastor and their role, um, unfortunately, I have a lot of grace and a lot of compassion for these pastors because generally these pastors are not pastors. They're pastor teachers, administrators, apostles, all at the same time kind of thing. Like they're, they're, they're doing all of this work, right? And if you're one of those people in the congregation who's not helping serve in your church, like you're why there's 80% of the people doing nothing and 20% are serving the 80%. And a lot of pastors get worn out. And I believe, you know, I'm not blaming the congregation for them falling into sin, but I'm just saying like, I think their job would be a lot easier if they weren't given all this burden and such pressure was placed on them. So again, just a side note, but pastors, I really feel for you. You got a lot that you have to do. But then you have some churches talking about how they have a teaching pastor and then they have a senior pastor. Senior pastor generally just means an administrator. This is somebody who's gifted with the gift of administration, which is a Romans 12 gift of the spirit that's mentioned. Or, or maybe you would argue that they're an apostle, right? And they're the one that delegating the things to the people to do. Again, like Peter did in Acts 5 to finding five or seven men filled with the Holy Ghost and a good report to go and wait tables. So we don't have this kind of definition of a pastor being a teacher at all in scripture. We don't see that played out in scripture. Again, teaching is a part of what a pastor does because a pastor would be like a secular version of a counselor, making sure that there's mental, spiritual wellness with their people, making sure that if there's massive conflicts in between the members of the church and stuff like that, they can kind of be a third party who's caring and tending to the flock, making sure that everything is good. If there's a false teaching, a false teacher, something like that, a wolf in sheep's clothing that comes in, that that pastor can come help be part of doing like the Matthew 18, maybe removing that person from their midst if that is something that is applicable in this context, or like the first Corinthians five, somebody who's living in habitual sin, removing them from their midst, right? That's the job of a pastor. That is not the job of a teacher. A teacher's job is to do what? Teach, right? Teacher, I mean, that's the easiest one we have in this whole thing. And evangelism is pretty easy too, like just preaching the gospel. A teacher's similar. Like you're somebody who's just teaching the word to people. So remember this whole conversation is in context of women in ministry. So the question is, can a woman be a pastor? If we're asking if a woman can be the pastor of a church, we're asking if a woman can tend to a flock. We're asking if a woman can nurture and meet the needs of the people in the body who are hurting. If we look at the 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 the, the spiritual, I, don't, I was gonna say genetic makeup, but the spiritual, but I guess I can argue that too. The spiritual or genetic makeup of a woman is nurturing anywhere in a female's midst. Yeah. Definitely, right? Like, I mean, straight from Genesis 3, this is clarified. That this nurturing aspect and this caring and tending aspect is definitely, unquestionably, part of a woman's genetic makeup. Now, we, as our church culture has grown today, we are using this word pastor in more nuanced or more um, uh, variety than we may be used to. 
I know growing up, I remember that the word pastor was used exclusively as the person who teaches and is the head person of the church. Now I'm seeing that like some churches, they have like one senior pastor and then they have like a decent amount of pastors maybe under them, depending on the kind of church that you're going to and stuff like that. And I think that actually that's actually more biblical than, I mean, it's definitely scripture teaches more biblical than just having one single, you know, big dog doing all the work, which by the way, generally most true you know, caring pastors, they don't want to be that one guy, but they're kind of forced into that position because there's not necessarily another option for them um, with, you know, how, again, how our culture has currently got things set up in America, at least. So can a woman be nurturing towards another individual? But yeah, like obviously, right? Like, duh, I don't think anyone would argue that. Can a, 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 a woman nurture their child or their husband or a female friend that they have? I think that we would all agree, yes. How about two? What if there were two girls and they came to a woman and they both needed counsel on a topic? Maybe they were in the same thing. Maybe they were both trying to date the same boy and they had issues or something like that. And they came to one girl. Would you say that, 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 that woman is able to nurture and care for them and tend to their needs? I think everybody would agree yes, right? I don't think anyone would, would argue that. How about three women? How about five women? How about five women and one man who was introducing something like that? I think most people would still agree yes. How about if those people were all in a building on Sunday morning? Is the answer no now? Why? Because they were in a building in the first example. They're just in a different building now. We just call that building a church. It's not a church, but we call it a church. It just happens to be a place where people gather together to have church, maybe, or be the church, more biblically speaking. But what kind of building are we allowed to teach in? What if a woman is in a church on a Tuesday with two other girls? Is that now wrong? Well, again, I don't think anybody would say that that's wrong. So what if she's sitting on a four foot elevated platform talking to those two women? I think the answer is still no. I don't think anyone would argue with that. Again, what if it was two women and two men and it was the spouses of those two girls that this woman is now giving counsel to? Is that wrong? Now, some people would say, now that's where the line is because there's men involved. Some people would say that. Some people would not say that. I, again, I, I see some division in the camp of no women in ministry on whether that would be appropriate. But something happens when you are now in front of an entire church that this becomes a problem. Mind you, not to mention, pastoral stuff is not a mass one person speaking to a bunch of people kind of strategy. It is a nurturing of the individuals in the church. This is a smaller group setting anyway. So the point that I want to make with that is I don't think that we can make any sort of logical conclusion that a female can't be a pastor. I think the conversation is whether a woman can be a teacher of a church congregation. Because again, a pastor, a, a woman can do that one-on-one, one-on-two, one on one-on-three, one on one on one on one-on-four. And I don't see anything wrong with that. And I don't know why somebody could see something wrong with it. There's nothing biblically that would argue there's something wrong with that. Your only potential that you could say is that scripture argues that it can only be towards females and females, not towards a man. Which still, you're making an assumption that it can be towards females. I understand why somebody might say that it's not towards men, but to say it's not towards females or is towards female, either way, you're making some sort of assumption there if you're sticking with that kind of mind frame. Remember, the word church just means the called together ones, the set apart ones, and that means that if there's two or more people, it's now defined as church because you are the body of Christ. You are an aspect, at least, of the global body of Christ. So your local church, if you have two or three people there, that is church. So again, can a woman mentor and, and met, you know meet the needs of those two or three women? I think that we would all agree yes. Now let's go to the teaching aspect before I tackle the man topic and go to 1 Timothy. Can a woman teach? Again, I've seen some division on this. Some people say absolutely no, not under any circumstance ever that they can teach. Okay, if I told you that there was one woman and she was discipling another woman, do we think it's biblical for females to disciple people or only men called to disciple? Everyone I've ever talked to says that all people are called a disciple. Cool. That means women have to teach. Women have to teach if women are going to be involved in the aspect of discipleship because a massive portion of discipleship, biblical discipleship, being with somebody on a daily basis or, you know, regularly throughout the week and mentoring that person, a massive portion of that is, again, teaching. That's a huge part of discipleship, right? How about if there were two women that one woman was teaching? Is that wrong now? Well, no, 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 because you're just discipling two women at the same time. How about three women? How about four women? How about five women? You get my idea. So now when is it wrong? When you're now in front of 50 women? Is, is, it, a, is it a quantity cutoff? Is it a gender cutoff? Is it a where you are on a Sunday morning versus on Tuesday afternoon getting coffee cutoff? What is the cutoff exactly? 
I, I don't tend to be able to get a very consistent answer from these people who are making this claim in regards to where that cutoff is. Let's assume though, I believe that the most biblical argument to what I'm saying is that it only cannot be from men or, or, or in conversation with a man teaching a woman. So let's go to this passage in 1 Timothy so that we can see what Paul's saying in context. We're going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 8. I want us to get a little bit of context. It says, Therefore I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Likewise, likewise to this thing that we just said in context of men, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly, discreetly, not braiding their hair in gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works as in as is proper for women making a claim of godliness. First off, there's a camp, Church of Christ people predominantly, who believe that this right here is saying that women are not allowed to braid their hair. Well, first off, that's not actually what it says. It says you're not allowed to braid your hair with gold uh, and, and silver. So you're not allowed to braid those things into your hair is actually what it's saying. But they would say that you're not allowed to braid your hair. So before I go to the rest of this, I want to make a point to this because this is relevant to our topic on whether women can teach or not. Do you believe in your spirit right now? And again, we're not just going to go off of feelings. We're going to go off scripture. But do you believe in your spirit that it is a sin for women to have their hair braided? Mom's cooking dinner. She's tired of her hair being in her face. So she braids it. Woman is going on a run. 16 year old girl. She's at running practice and she's tired of her hair getting in her face. So she braids it instead of ponytails it. Is that wrong? Is it a sin to braid your hair? I think we, most of us would agree that it's not a sin. There's just something in your spirit even that's just like, I don't see what would be wrong with that. So why is Paul saying it? Well, we got to remember, Paul is talking to people who understand the full context of what he's saying and why he is saying. You and I do not today unless we've studied their culture and their context, which I encourage you to do, especially when you come up on things like this that might seem a little bit perplexing. Why is he saying this? Why is he saying this this way? Well, he's saying it this way for a few reasons. First off, culturally, there's many who believe that women who would wear these kinds of clothes, or excuse me, wear these kinds of braids were commonly in culture known as people who were pagan. The pagans were having gold and silver braided in their hair. So it's almost like today, if I were to, let's say, have lines on a patch that I wore on my shirt or lines on a patch on my arm, that there's, you know, imagine somebody saying that that's extremely wrong to have lines on a patch on my arm. Nobody would say that. What if it's a swastika? Okay, now it's pretty serious. That's a pretty big deal if you're gonna have a swastika tattooed on you or, or on, a sh on a patch on your arm or on your shirt. That's a really big deal. You're making an extremely huge statement with no words said, right? It's a pretty big deal. So from the, the actual idea of the image of a swastika being a big deal, we obviously know that there's a huge red flag here, that there's a huge no-no with having a swastika. In the same way, this was a pagan symbol where you're saying a lot by having your hair braided. Um, some others believe that this had to do uh, a lot with the people who were prostitutes, that they would have gold and this whatnot braided in their hair. And then, you know, finally, on top of all that stuff, that, you know, you having these things braided into your hair, think about it. Do you own gold or silver personally? A lot of people do not. And if you do, you know it's pretty expensive to buy things that way. So people who have like gold chains, there's a reason that they don't have plastic chains, carbon fiber chains, rubber chains. Why is it a gold chain? because gold is a very expensive piece to have around your neck. So if you know that somebody has $100,000 around their neck, that's a pretty big deal. You know that that person's really rich. In the same way, imagine you have that same kind of thing, but it's just in your hair now. What kind of point are you trying to prove, right? You're trying to prove a very evident point to people about how rich you are. So Paul is making a claim to these people. You guys are being intentionally distracting by showing off. Not to mention, again, there's a really good chance that this is something that people who are prostitutes are doing at the time. And this is something who people who are pagan are doing at the time. And you know this, but you're doing it anyways for a fashion statement or maybe to get the attention of people as Paul goes on to mention. Because if that's why you're doing it, you really need to stop doing that. Now, does that mean that gold in hair is a sinful thing in and of itself? Well, no, because if you had a, a, a gold, you know, bead or braid or something in your hair today, no one would be like, oh, she's a prostitute. No one would be like, oh, she's a pagan. 
no one would think a single, a single thing of it, right? And not to mention, there's so many fake gold things nowadays that, you know, it's one of those things that like, we don't really see in our culture as much today as back then, that like having gold is this like, <gasps> like having gold earrings, like, oh my gosh, that person's super rich. Like you didn't think that last time you saw a girl's gold jewelry, right? Because again, it's not one of those things that's as common and, and used as a flex like it was at this time, right? I mean, I remember 10, 15 years ago, I remember I wanted a chain. I actually have a school picture where I was wearing a chain because I thought I was hot stuff because I had a chain around my neck, right? Even back then, I remember those things being more of a social status and kind of a cool thing than they are today. Or having a brand new car, right? I remember 10, 15 years ago, if you had a brand new car, I was like, whoa, that person's rich. Whereas today, if you have a brand new car, that kind of thing is not one of, it's kind of like, yeah, we have a brand new car. What's wrong with that, right? You gotta like have a super nice car, like a Lamborghini to be seen as like, whoa, that guy's rich, right? So anyways, the point is in their culture, this was seen as a big deal at that time. And not only has that change happened in 15 years of like gold chains and cars, but we're talking about thousands of years of change. Let's go on. It says, um, a woman must qu must quietly receive instructions and entire submission and entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Again, I find it strange that a lot of people I talk to, they would say that a woman's not allowed to teach at all, let alone in front of a man. Okay, that's not what it says. It specifically says in front of a man. It does not say at all. It says in front of a man. So that's my challenge there is why would you not let a woman teach in any capacity? And okay, when we say in front of a man, are we referring to an adult male of certain age? What is that age cutoff? Because again, why are you letting your children's pastor who's a female teach other males, like, you know, boys, males? Is it because they're too young? Well, what age are we seeing this man thing? Is it 17? Is it 18? Is it when they get their driver's license? Is it when they can drink alcohol legally? What is that age? Again, I just want you to consider what you may have not thought about with this passage, with this passage before. I'm going to go on and then I'll explain. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. It was not Adam who was deceived, but it was the woman who had been deceived and fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through their bearing of children if they continue in the faith, in love, and sanctity with self-restraint. Again, this self-restraint aspect is something that even back then, it's not that you're not supposed to be self-restraint today as a woman or a man, but the point was he's referring this specifically to a female because females obviously had a much bigger issue with this back then than we have with this today. That's why like, you know, I, I've never heard a pastor ever be like, whoa, woman, are you self-restrained? Like, I've never heard anybody say that because this isn't something that is as big of an issue today as we had back then. So that's point number one. Point number two is why did he not tell men to be self-restrained? Is it okay for women or for men not to be self-restrained? Well, the point isn't that men need to not be self-restrained, but women do, sucks to suck. The point is, is that he's referring something to women who at that time in this church, remember Paul's not writing to the global body of Christ. He's writing to a specific church in first Timothy, right? He's telling these women that Timothy is overseeing to some extent or pastoring over to some extent that he needs to make sure that these women at this church are making sure that they are self-restrained. It's not because men don't have to be self-restrained. It's because the men in this body don't have an issue with self-restraint. It says to continue in faith and in love and in sanctity of self-restraint. Do men not need to continue in faith and in love either? Well, obviously we know that men are unquestionably supposed to be loving and faithful as well but they weren't having an issue that Paul felt a need to mention towards women specifically in this. So although I'm not going to use this logic and say all things mentioned in scripture are only relevant to that church, it's pretty evident that these topics here are specifically in reference to the issues that this church was having, right? Just like in other places in scripture, uh, like, you know, Revelation 3, where it says that you are neither hot nor cold. And since you are neither hot nor cold, but you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Although that can have application to all Christians, I don't believe that's applicable to me. I don't think that he was saying that to me because I am lukewarm. He's saying that because it's something that we need to watch out for is people being lukewarm. And then we need to uh, address that accordingly once we see that person being lukewarm. But again, it's not relevant to me because it's not, it wasn't written to me specifically personally for my lukewarmness. It was written to the principle of being lukewarm. In the same way here, when it's telling a woman that she is not allowed to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet, again, we've got to take this logic to its fullest extent. Are you saying that a woman under no circumstance ever is able to speak? She's supposed to remain quiet as Paul's words. So is she never able to speak? Well, obviously she's able to speak. So obviously that's not what he means here. Is she saying, is, is Paul saying that she's never able to speak to a male? Well, obviously we all know that that's not the case either, right? Because your wife at her job is now sinning because she's speaking to a man. 
Do you think your wife at her job has ever spoken to a man and the man has learned something? Or even at your church or your small group, has a woman ever had any sort of input that anybody else in your small group was benefiting from? I, can, I guarantee it. I hope so, at least. If not, I'd say that she's doing something significantly wrong. So if a man has gleaned some sort of understanding about spiritual truths from a woman at a small group, and that wasn't sin, then again, there has to be more to this conversation than just what happens to meet the eye here. What is it? These women that Paul was speaking to in this context were spending their time getting loud, making sure that they are are distracting from the actual Sunday service, quote unquote, Sunday service. And they are trying to show off with their beauty, with their looks, with this gold in their hair, so that you can see that we're keeping up with the Joneses and you're not. They're doing these things. And Paul is making an extreme, a radical statement and saying, don't talk then. Problem solved. Don't talk. Paul makes a very similar mention in Galatians when he's talking to those people who are preaching that Gentiles are to stay under the condemnation of the old covenant law and preaching circumcision. In Galatians, Paul says, I wish that man who was preaching this circumcision, that this man would mutilate himself. I'll keep this PG for the listeners, but mutilation of yourself is an extremely disgusting, intense decision to make, to make a point that you should stop doing what you're doing. Jesus, similarly in Matthew 5, says, uh, you've heard of prophets of old do not commit adultery. I say whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. And then he goes on to say, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, cast it from you. It's better to enter heaven without a hand than hell with your whole body intact. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. Do you think that Jesus is literally telling you to saw your hand off and pluck your eye out? No, you understand that it's a figure of speech. It's an extreme thing that he's saying. It's like me saying like, oh my gosh, like I just destroyed that guy the other day in basketball. You don't think that I literally destroyed him as in like annihilated his humanity. You know that I mean, I just crushed him in basketball, but I'm trying to show how badly I beat him in basketball by saying I destroyed him or I annihilated him in basketball. You know that that means that the score is probably something like 20 to one, right? And that's not the case for me. I suck at basketball. But in a similar way, Paul and Jesus are both saying, I wish you would mutilate yourself and I wish you would pluck your eye out and cast it from you. The point here is what you're doing is a really big deal and you need to stop doing it. That's the point of this. Just like saying that women are not to speak at all. That's what it says is to speak at all. It never says to speak in certain context. It just says you're not supposed to speak at all in this context of men at all. If that's the case and it's fullest, most extreme extent, then your wife is not allowed to speak at a small group. Your wife is not allowed to speak at a job site. Your wife is not allowed to preach the gospel to anybody in public because a man could overhear and then end up being a teaching moment and then she's living in sin. So Paul wants you to understand that if you are unable to do something responsibly and like Jesus has called you to, that you're not supposed to do it at all. And I think this is even more expounded in James, where James says, not many of you should become teachers, brethren, for you will incur a stricter judgment. He's not saying don't teach. The point of that passage is to say, I want less people teaching. The point of that passage is saying, for those who are teaching, make sure that you know what you're teaching because you will incur a stricter judgment for the things that you're teaching. The point isn't don't teach. The point is do teach, but teach cautiously, teach carefully. If we're, te if we're teaching carefully, we're going to make sure that we're not leading other people astray. I believe that this teaching that women are not allowed to speak in any sort of place that is going to help or benefit somebody else or a man for that matter, I think is an extremely, extremely unfortunate teaching to make. And it's something that is helping keeping women oppressed. I'm not doing this liberal woke thing or, or this, this new age thinking progress. I'm not doing that. All I'm saying is simply saying, Women have valuable things to say. God has given them spiritual truths, just like he has given spiritual truths to men to speak to the rest of the body of Christ, to make sure that they are able to be blessed and edified and equipped for the edification of the body so that they can go and fill out the fullness of the stature in Christ, like Ephesians 4, right? Like that is so something that God has given the body of Christ. God has given discipleship to the body of Christ. And also I want to clarify, I am not saying, hey woman, I want you to go to an all men's conference and be the singular teacher at that. I'm not saying that that's the solution here. This isn't some sort of necessarily woman empowerment thing. It's women have things to say that can incredibly and significantly impact the body of Christ for the better. My wife is one of those people. I've listened to female pastors on or preachers, excuse me, online that I've been so blessed by. I've heard other females evangelize and it's really blessed 
blessed me. It's encouraged me and going, wow, I never thought of it that way. I can do this that way in the future, just like I saw this female do it. These women aren't trying to be submissive and force me into submission under them by any means like that passage. I agree with that. I don't think that we should be forcing people into submission under us uh, as a female should be forcing a man into submission under us. I think that that's doing this weird, strange thing anyways. But I do believe that us as Christians are supposed to all preach the gospel, all be teaching to some extent, even if you're not a teacher of a church or a YouTube ministry or something like that that women have been given a gift by God to help educate and train other believers to be able to come to the full stature of Christ. Last example I'll give, and then I'll, I'll, I'll end here. What do you think about a mother teaching her son as a homeschooled kid? How about even at the age of 18? Like a Christian mom homeschooling her kid and talking about Christian principles and teaching her kid at 18. I'm just trying to poke little holes in this idea so that you get a broader understanding of what scripture might be meaning here versus just men cannot teach two women, period, into discussion. Obviously, we want our women, our mothers to bless their children by teaching them the things of the Lord, even once they're 18, still seniors in high school, but still 18 and technically an adult by today's uh, terms. We still want them teaching, don't we? Why, why would they stop? It doesn't make any sense. There's no logical conclusion you can come to other than getting a cultural misunderstanding that we're seeing from one verse in Timothy without having the cultural or contextual context of what Paul's actually trying to say to this church. I'm so thankful for the men teachers out there. I'm so thankful for the female teachers out there. I think that we should do less oppressing of all people who are trying to teach and bring forth the kingdom even people who have a different doctrinal belief like maybe you disagree with me even after this and that's okay but like are you just going to say hey we're going to shut him down or shut him up because he's saying something that we don't agree with this is the kind of thing that i see christians do regularly because you believe baptism should happen at this age and in this way and things like that but you do not believe that it should happen uh in, in somebody else's way and then you immediately just shut them down I don't think this is a healthy thing for us as believers to do in the body of Christ. We are all believers. We're all part of one body. We're all going to be in the same level of Christianity. There's not like the super holy ones that get to fly around the throne room with Jesus while the other ones are on the outer gates, shaking the gates, hoping to get in one day because they didn't do as much. We are all the body. Jesus is the head and we are under submission to Jesus. And I believe that we are all equipped with gifts that are supposed to help glorify, edify and grow the body of Christ to its fullest extent, and women just happen to also be a part of that, just like men are. If it's been a blessing to you, uh, please feel free to like the video. It just helps get other people to see and learn more about Jesus. I appreciate you all. Love you all. Chat with you guys in the next one.